So we wrapped up our series on the water today, and we really dove into Psalm 23 looking at um, the fact that without the shepherd in the psalm, it's just bleak, it's just lost. It's darkness and evil and loneliness. So when we look at our own lives, we understand that um, we are blessed not just to know who Jesus is, but to know we have a constant companion in this life and to know that God does ordain some, uh, when I say ordain, God does lead us, as the 23rd Psalm says, into paths of righteousness for his namesake. And some of those paths are through the valley of the shadow of death. And we need to know that the storms of life and some of the difficult circumstances are not only, not only ordained by God, but they're for our benefit to grow into the image of Christ, to let this world lose its grip on us and us on it and grab on to the good shepherd. So when we look at today, we need to understand the hope and the promise that we find in the 23rd Psalm is that without the shepherd, all is lost. But with the shepherd, everything is purposeful, even the hard, dark roads. So take courage today. Take courage and understand that you, the people of God, are called to grow into Christ's image in the good days, in the, in the really you know, high mountaintop or in the shepherding language, the pasture land days, and in the valley of the shadow of death. When you are having the hardest time, know that you don't walk it alone. You walk it with the good shepherd who's desiring to bring out of you the fullness of who you were created to be, a Christian, one who lives and becomes the mirror image of Christ in this world. So for question number one, uh, we, we ask you something about the poem of the desperate soul. And really it was just a poem we wrote, um, Erica and I worked on together as we uh, looked at the 23rd Psalm without the shepherd. It says this, I am exhausted. I am parched, which means thirsty. I don't know which way to go. It is dark. There is evil. I'm surrounded by enemies. I am alone. I am empty. There is no future for me. When you look at the poem of a desperate soul, are there points in your own life with which you identify with the writer? Many people know or have heard of the 23rd Psalm before. We find it comforting. Did you ever notice, though, the person speaking doesn't claim life is without its trials? There are dark valleys, shadows, and enemies. The difference is the company and the leadership of the shepherd. Do you agree with this? Twenty third Psalm starts with the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Does that mean you get everything you want? It goes on to say, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he restores or refreshes my soul. Have you ever had a time where the good shepherd told you to lie down, just to rest? All right, he guides me along right paths for his namesake. And what this tells us is that there are right paths in this life. That, this means that there must be wrong paths as well. Do you believe that there are right paths and wrong paths? Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The translation of the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death is the deepest shadow. When have you walked in that place? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This means that, though, that you may be in the middle of a battle in your physical life or in a spiritual battle, but God will sustain you. He will provide what you need. I want to know, how does he do this or how has he done this? You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the end of the 23rd Psalm. This, the poem of a desperate soul ends with, I have no future. How does the good shepherd, 
the Lord Jesus Christ and the word of God help us feel secure about our future. So this week's question is, if we said we were going to get half the money, why did we order steel and begin the process of closing on the, on the land? That's a good question. Um, I am not one who will sit very often and say, thus says the Lord, and I heard a word from the Lord. But I will tell you in this instance, um, I was standing at my kitchen sink. I was washing a dish, which if you knew my mom, and when she's chewing on it's like thinking about stuff, she'll wash a dish or it's just a weird thing. And I, I don't remember specifically what I was thinking about, but I was standing there and I was just working at the, at the kitchen sink washing something. And, um, and I will say the Lord spoke to me. Um, and the question was very simple. It was, did you have half the money when you began this project? And I answered and I started having a conversation. I was, I think I was alone at home. I was, I was alone at home at this time. And I started having a conversation and I answered that question, which was, did you have half the money when you started this project on Main Street? And I stopped washing the dish. I, it's so funny, I can see it so clearly. I stepped back and I said, no, but on Main Street, it was a much smaller number. And I started giving my answer. And then about halfway through, I stopped and I was like, what are you asking of me? And that's why I said out loud, standing in the kitchen, I didn't know what the Lord was asking of me. And um, the Lord just impressed on me that the amount we had pledged and raised currently was the same percentage as what we had when we started this project. And so I did the math and it's exactly the same percentage wise. And so I said, okay, I will, um, I will go to the finance person. I will talk with Lindsay. I will talk with the board in the building committee and tell them what I believe I heard from you, Lord, and we'll let it go from there. When I shared that with everybody, everybody said, yep, we got to pull the trigger. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I mean, I was excited. And there's no going back when you believe you've heard the word of the Lord. I believe we heard it and we stepped out in faith. That is why we did it. We don't have any reason beyond um, a discerned conversation with the Lord that I had. I shared with the leadership and, um, I don't know, I, all I can say is there was eager reception for it and it seemed right, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit to not delay another step and just get after it and trust that God is in this process. Even if we feel a little shorthanded in terms of cash, he is not, he still owns the cattle on a thousand hills and we are trusting him and moving forward. Am I nervous? Yeah, just a little because I mean, if I could, I would write the check, but it would bounce so high. So I can't, I can just trust in God. And that's what we're doing from the leadership down. We are just trusting that God is speaking and leading in this. And we're hoping that this spurs inside of our church a desire to be generous and participate with us because without the faithful participation of the church, we would be in a lot of trouble. So here's some of the numbers of where we're at right now. We have about $915,000 pledged. Of that, we have about $675,000 that has yet to come in. So we're hoping that'll come in and that this will spur some generosity within our church and get people kind of giving and, and training their sites on, um, on you know, following God and mission with this. Also, ca uh, collected cash to date. Right now, we've collected $448,000. So we've collected 448, we have pledged um, that 975 and the outstanding pledges are 675. If you add all that up, I'm sure it makes sense mathematically, but I'm dyslexic, so sorry about that. So at the Foundry Church, we continue participating with God where he's at work and we believe he led us into this decision and we're faithfully following him. Um, it is, a, it is one of those things where all we can say is we're doing what seems best to us and the Holy Spirit. It does feel like the Spirit of God spoke in that and leadership and myself joyfully, not hesitantly, joyfully obeyed and dove in. It's a lot of fun, a little scary, but hey, that's, that's just kind of part of life in the foundry right now and we value that. All right, finally, we're going to do a staff introduction real quick. Um, I've got no problem. Well, we can, we'll give her a separate mic. Yep. Oh. Hi, my name is Erica Folkers, and I am... I was going to introduce her, but she can go ahead. That's fine. I am very thankful to work at the Foundry. There's a couple parts to my job. The first part is that I am Eric's assistant, which works 
pretty conveniently. And, and I just to say, her boss is good looking. She's kind of got a thing for him. <laughs> I helped put together his schedule and his um, kind of his work life work list for the week and that sort of thing. The other part of my job um, has to do with the content, and I work with Eric to organize and lay out the sermon series and then make sure that that coincides with our devotion content and our group's content. And then the other part of ministry that I'm involved in is the creative team, and that is when we want to add visual or musical or um, different kinds of elements to the Interpretive video, to the, to the sermon or sermon series, just to help engage people. Um, yeah, and yeah. all those things, devotions and creative, have awesome people on a team working with, so it's not just mine to do alone. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything you want to say about me or we share an office? My boss? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's amazing. How dare you? <laughs> all right. Hi. Oh, no. No. Just. No, I want a moment. <laughs> Maybe. See what happens? That's why you respect your boss, your employer. I'm probably going to need a ride home from Eric Bazan here in a minute. All right. Yeah, Eric had just walked straight over to Lindsay Human Resources. It's like, I'd like to lodge a complaint. Denied! All right. Have a great week. Hope you enjoyed small groups.